seems somewhat appropriate that this tripod just kind of broke. Because um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about uh, dissonance and what life feels like when it's not working. Where you suddenly feel um, disconnected and uncomfortable and insincere and doubting and alone and sad. I mean, go, you, know, you know all the words, it goes on and on. <clears throat> and these are very, very common human experiences. The kind of what's wrong with me experience where things break and they get lost and you sit and you try to meditate yourself into a better place and that doesn't work and you know <clears throat> you eat a bite of chocolate and it doesn't taste good it could whatever whatever your mechanisms are for trying to get into greater comfort more um, a pleasurable zone just don't happen All I can tell you is this is real life. That there are vast spectrums of experience. <coughs> and not all of them feel good. And much of the human uh, experience is trying to get to good. This would feel, I want it to be good. I want it to feel good. I want it to be like it was yesterday. I don't like this version of it. I want it to be better. And, and sometimes forces are acting on you that are really strong and in a very discomforting way. The other day I, <clears throat> I lost my, I have a money clip that my son Ari gave me that says stay close. So it has an emotional element to it. And for whatever reason I had like $500 in it. And I lost it. And I just, it was just gone. And I've tried to replay where could this have happened. And I think you've all been through these kinds of things. And I literally retraced my steps. I went back to the supermarket. I went back to the restaurant. And I walked the entire walk of the mile, two miles almost, that I had walked thinking, because I had pulled some tissues out of my pocket somewhere and could easily have pulled it out. Nowhere. It was nowhere. And... The night that it happened, I got saddled with this deep sense of loss. And I added to it because it was my son's gift to me and because it said stay close and like suddenly it was amplified by having a personal element. It wasn't the money, it was my connection to my son. And my brain started really getting caught up in all of this and I'm looking at it and going, <laughs> You know, you're, 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 you're supposed to be awake here. You're supposed to be conscious. You're supposed to be living this life of <coughs> awareness. And why are you caught in this drama? And I, I, really, I really felt unworthy as that was happening. And, and I said, look it, I'm just not going to get caught up in this. And I went to bed. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, I wake up. That's all I'm thinking about. <laughs> And I'm retracing all of my steps again, and I cannot see the moment where this unconscious thing took place. I can't figure it out. And then I had this memory that came out of the ether, and I, I knew it was a gift. And it said, when you were in India, just a month ago, and you were lying flat out on the ground saying thank you for everything to the universe, you also said, rather directly, take it all. Take it all. I'm not here to gain anymore. There's nothing I want. Take it all. And it was like the universe winked at me and said, we're taking it. <laughs> <laughs> and they took my money clip and they took my <clears throat> the money <clears throat> and I was left <clears throat> being given 
my wish. And that really strangely satisfied. And I went back to bed and slept beautifully. The next morning, somewhere in the middle of the morning, I went, oh, my money clipped. Oh, I, they took it. <laughs> and this little thing played itself out, and it was like a little bit better than it might have been, but it still was reflecting itself over and over. And I really, I really realized I have to work. There's process here. It's not as heavy lifting as other things that have happened in my life. I didn't lose a person. I didn't lose whatever it may be, a job. I, I lost the money clip. And, and so every time it came up, I had to do this thing of going, okay. It was a very gentle work, but it was essential. I had to do what I had learned to do over the course of time, which is every time your mind, or in some ways really your emotive being, your emotional life, comes back and goes, oh, oh, whatever that thing is, that grief, that sense of failure or loss or, or dis dissonance, when it comes up, there's something you can do, which is part of the practice that we do here, which is kind of asking for help to surrender, to let go. But you have to do it. It doesn't just happen by itself. I mean, it can. There are times where it really does just happen. It just, you go, okay, I, I'm done with that. And it's really gone. But many times it reintroduces itself. The grieving process, for those of you who've been through it, either with people or things, understand that it has a wave action. It comes and it goes, and it comes more frequently at certain times, and then it's slower and slower, and then it hardly ever after a while. And you learn to accommodate the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as Shakespeare put it, and you live a life with stuff that happens. Sometimes beautiful, wonderful things go on in our lives, and sometimes not such wonderful things go on. And when they're not so wonderful, how are you going to embody that? And there was a part of me that wanted to go, you're bigger than this, you're better than this, why are you getting caught by it? Then there was another part that says, better or not better, it's happening. This is real. Do the work. Do the work. And the work for me was take a breath and let it out. And wow, that really helps. It just brings you back to a kind of balance, a kind of okayness, a kind of harmony. And for a period of time, everything is fine, and then whatever it is comes up, and the same thing comes flying back at you again. And you have a choice of either getting just as riled up as you did before, or going, whoa. And you bring yourself back to stillness, centeredness, openness, availability, saying yes to the what is of life, and it has a extraordinarily beautiful harmonizing quality. Does it last beyond five minutes or ten minutes or an hour? Maybe. If it doesn't last, you have a job to do. You have work to do. And that work is, remember, you can take a breath. You can ask for help in this difficult moment. If your choice is to beat yourself up, why me? Why am I so stupid? Why do I lose things? <coughs> I'm no good. What's this, what's this all about? It's all a lie. Nothing is real. Nothing is... Blah, blah, blah. I mean, you just go on into this magnificent kind of drama that some people actually engage their entire life. And then you're just caught up in endless references to the negativity of your being, and you suffer. You keep digging holes of unhappiness, and you jump in them. And if somebody asks, why are you doing that? I'm not sure you'd even have an answer other than the fact, it's what I do. It's how I live. You know, I'm no good. Life isn't fair. I wasn't given my fair share. It should have been otherwise, and it wasn't otherwise. And people, I hate 
the world that did this to me, and people hate me, and I, you know, you know that the drama, the mind drama, that goes on is so extraordinary, and I think many, I could say most, but I don't know it, but I think many people are addicted to these dark negative currents in their lives, and life will indulge that, because life sometimes gives you wonderful things, and some days are just not fun. Things happen. Somebody says the wrong thing to you. Somebody, you know, you wait one, two hour, too many hours online with DirecTV. Or whatever it is, you, you go through these things that just dispirit, are dispiriting. They just rob you. And your job is do the work. You want to yell at the person on the other line, but instead you say, look, I know this is hard, and let's make this happen. You do these moments of what I would call honesty, where you're honest with yourself and you go, this, this sucks. This really sucks. I don't like losing $500. I don't like losing my son's money clip. But, in the end, to be Buddhist about it, everything is impermanent, everything is uncertain, and everything will be taken away, including when you get to my age, you start to realize your mind. Mm -hmm. Where did I put it? Where did I do that? How, I, I, don't, I can't figure it out. I'll tell you the upshot of this story, which is not a good upshot in terms of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but it's an interesting upshot, which is, a day later, I'm emptying the pockets. I, well, actually, I've been emptying. I, my, I was, my pants were hanging over the edge of the couch, and I'm going to pick the, get the, lift them up to take them to the cleaners, and out falls my money clip and all my money. <laughs> I had checked every pocket. I had looked everywhere possible for that clip. There it is. And the universe kind of looked at me like, <laughs> you, you idiot, you know? And at the same time, it gave me a gift. And I couldn't figure out how to put the gift together with what I'd gone through. I'd finally kind of accepted that it was taken away. Now what does it mean? i got to go through that again with the next thing that's taken away? Or is there a lesson? Is there no lesson here? Probably no lesson. It just is. It's the way things go. I, I looked in, I truly looked in every pocket, so how it came out of something out of the ether, it was like magic, but it was like this great experience that reminded me that life at times truly sucks, and it's not fun, and you have, through your choice of uh, opportunity, to say, I'm going to do something about the suckiness, I am going to take a breath, exhale, ask for help if I need it, even if I don't need it, to let go. <coughs> and I'm going to walk through the next five minutes or ten minutes or two hours feeling balanced and harmonious again. And then when that little thing comes up, I'm going to do the same thing, and I'm going to find a way to make life livable and joyful even for periods of time. And when it's not livable and joyful, you can try to do the work, and if it doesn't work, if everything you try doesn't work, then you just go, oh well, oh well. Interesting what oh well does. Oh well almost takes care of it. It doesn't take care of it 100%, but it's like, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. I lost it. It's gone. I tried taking a breath, and the breath didn't work. Oh well. And it's almost as good as the breath. You just walk around going, okay. You know, and I was walking down the, the road to town. <coughs> it's springtime here, it's so beautiful, the flowers are coming up everywhere. And so on my walk, every other minute I'm looking for a money clip. But <laughs> every other minute I'm just looking at the flowers, going, whew. And then I started taking pictures of the flowers. And the flowers are gloriously beautiful. And then, because you all know I'm playing with photography, I start going into the flowers and I put them on my computer and I blow them up so that I'm just getting these little Georgia O'Keeffe moments of just pure color and form. And it's so beautiful. And so much of that comes out of looking for my money clip. I'm walking down the street and seeing stuff that punctuates the misery. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize all of this because 
it's not all one thing. It's not all suffering. It's not all beauty. It's not all perfection. Imperfection has the role to play in life as big as perfection. And we have to be big enough and open enough and willing to work hard enough to see that. Because life is what it is at any given moment and nothing you can do is going to determine what it is. But everything you can do to open to what is, is essential. Embracing the truth of it is better than fighting it. Walking around saying, okay, is better than saying, not okay. Because the not okay knottedness is so intense. <clears throat> and when you're knotted like that, <clears throat> the hardness of that becomes breakable. You become very, very uh, fragile. When you're open and you bend like you know, the leaves of grass. Very hard to break a leaf of grass. You want to become this free-flowing, open entity that dances in the wind. That's what we want. Because there's such beauty in that. And such resilience in that. And because sometimes the winds are really hard and they keep you flat against the earth. And sometimes they're very gentle and you spring back up and you just wave in the sunlight. And it's beautiful and it's simple. Life is simple. It is a beautiful experience except when it's not. And what you start to learn after a while, one is you have techniques, mechanisms, gifts of an ability to accept the reality of what is. To breathe into it so that you can change your reaction to it or your relationship to it and this ability to live long enough to watch things change. Because they do. It's always changing. One of the things I do a lot, uh, as you know, is I go for a walk. It's amazing what a walk does. Just going for a walk, whatever you're dealing with that's constricting you when you're sitting still in your house, breaks apart while you're walking. Things happen. You see people. The flowers, the cracks in the sidewalk, on and on and on, it all just starts to re-engineer what's going on and it brings it back into motion, into flow, into fluidity and often, often takes care of the suckiness of your life. Just motion. There was a line I read so many years ago but I love it. It's called, God loves those who are in motion. <clears throat> And the reason that that line appeals to me is because I understand how hard it is for God or any cosmic force to get into that which is inert. It can't be moved easily. But once it's in motion, things happen. You can happen. Possibilities happen. Life opens up. It's not locked into a destructive pattern. It's not locked into a uh, <clears throat> frozen space. It's melting. It's allowing possibility. The endless beauty of life has an opportunity to come into you, to reflect itself within you. And the great thing about yogic practice, learning to yoke with the one, to move toward the one, is that you realize that the one is a container for joy and misery, for finding and losing for happy and sad. It's a big container. And I understand why ego mind gravitates toward happy and comfort and ease and joy. I understand why it can get caught in laziness and inertia and <clears throat> despair. But the whole idea of yoga, the whole idea of meditation, the whole idea of spiritual work and spiritual growth is you have choice to maintain or to change the situation. Totally up to you. You have choice. You can make it different than what it is. And all you have to do is change your relationship to what is because you can't always change the what is. So your house just burned down. That's the what is. Endless despair, loss, everything I ever had that meant anything was in that house. 
the work that comes out of, I'm still here. My family's still here. That, you see this on the news all the time. <clears throat> there are people who are sitting there in total despair, and there are people who are recognizing the powerful, positive side of it, that what's meaningful still is around. Those are choices that we all make. We choose the powerful, uplifting one, or the very dark, deep, deepening and dampening one. Here's a good thing. Deep and uplifting kind of end in the same place. Deep despair, deep sadness, all of that has the potential to take you into a kind of profound awareness of truth. And so does great uplifting, upliftment. You arise at this extraordinary place of knowing. Sometimes the only way to arise at this to arrive at this place of profound knowing is through the depth of despair. And there are people who can tell you that. Through the greatest of losses, they found themselves. This is not always true. And I know people, I have friends, who are in a kind of despairing state, who feel true clinical depression, for whom life is really a bottomless pit of suffering. This is a real space, and people go there. And all you can do is, if you know the people like that, offer enormous compassion and maybe even medical help. But it's a very real space. But it is a space that is on some level indulged, meaning that there is some very heavy lifting and real work that can begin to help you climb out of the cave of despair. And the true darkness of real despair is you have no sense of the light at the top, that the walls you can use to climb against, or that there's any help at all. And I truly understand that, and I have at some points in life tried to be the light that reached into that space to help people out. And what I've realized in many cases is that they resented my help. They resented somebody else trying to pull them out of their despair for reasons that I cannot fully understand. <clears throat> Part of it may be a deeper knowing that they have further to go to find themselves and the truth. And part of it is that they like it. That it's kind of like a deep meditation in the dark side as opposed to a meditation in light. People sometimes choose that path. All, all I'm saying is there is available to all of us a kind of work that can, in most cases, help us. There are some cases that it cannot help us, and one can be only compassionate when one encounters that. But for those who can be helped and guided and supported and uplifted by your awareness, your consciousness, your kindness, your compassion, use it. Use that work to lift yourself up out of your own malaise and unhappiness and use it to help other people out of theirs. And once you learn how to do it yourself with your own internal process, you will find a muscle that you can share with other people. And that's one of the great gifts of what we do, of spiritual work, where you realize I know how to do this. I know what to do. Part of it is you do that for yourself. You can't necessarily breathe for another person, but you can do all these really interesting things. You can hold their hand. You can put your hand on their shoulder, on their back. You can listen to them. You can watch them struggle with their breath. You can watch them trying to get there. 
You can say, I care. I love you. I'm here for you. You can just listen. You can be not prescriptive and not judgmental, just present tense. Just be present. And in fact, just being present is the same thing as taking a breath. Because that brings you to presence. And if you bring that presence to somebody else, that helps them in their life. So, don't despair when there's a sucky day. Don't despair when you lose your money clip. Don't give in to the temptation to say everything is horrible, because it's not. Know that this will pass, or this too shall pass, as they used to say. And allow yourself to go for a walk, take a breath, and keep living until the dynamic moves in a direction that is more joyful and comfortable. It will do that, ultimately. So, I guess the, the lesson for today is do the work. Do the work. Don't give in to sadness and despair and depression and all the other stuff. Take the breath. Do the work. Out of that, life and possibility emerge. Present tense arises. Presence becomes the dynamic, vital, absolutely uh, ennobling force of every second of our life. And it's available to you if you reach for it. Any questions? And your money clip may fall out of your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>